you to you guys for organizing all that. Uh, today's panel is going to be on wealth managers embracing P2P as a new asset class. And I think it's obviously an important subject because in the end of the day, investors are the ones, for, certainly for the direct lenders, using investors' capital as an important part of the direct lending equation. Uh, secondly, the business is truly in its infancy. You guys saw some earlier some numbers which showed about $4.5 uh, billion of origination done over the last seven years, and this includes global origination. And to put that into perspective, that's less than a small position in the PIMCO total return fund. Uh, and if you think about it from a money management perspective, in the sense of dedicated assets to direct lending, the number's still probably close to a billion bucks. So the industry is truly in its infancy, which suggests there'll be a lot of changes, and we'll hear from the, from the speakers today what they think about that. Uh, Brandon Ross is actually one of the early people involved in this space, also one of the early investors, I believe, in the LC Advisors Fund, and subsequently has gone on to create a dedicated fund concentrating more on small business. Yeah. Brandon? Great. Um, so I wear two hats. As president of Ross Asset Advisors, I manage a small amount of wealth, myself, my family, and some clients. I'm going to try to talk more with that hat on than with my other hat as president of Direct Lending Advisors, which buys small business loans on the IAU Central platform. IAU Central wasn't here today. They look a lot like OnDeck um, and have been in business for a few years. So I don't tend to think of this space as being peer-to-peer -peer lending. I think of it as being private debt 2.0, meaning it's more transparent and it's more efficient, but it's private debt. It's contractual, self-liquidating cash flow. And that's what I like. And on the wealth management side, I have taken a lot of assets out of the equity markets and out of the bond markets and put them into the kind of contractual, self-liquidating, short-term cash flow that is private debt. So um, when you're trying to work with clients and help them understand why this is a good idea, you have to have a story. For me, the story is really Renault's slide that shows that um, uh, interest rates have fallen and uh, rates charged on private debt, in his slide showed credit card rates, have not changed. So whether that's because of red tape and regulation, whatever it is about fractional reserve banking that has prevented the banks from forcing the rates down in these products, that's the story, right? We can charge a lot for this stuff. Um, what does it replace? Like I said, for me, it replaces uh, equities because I think, especially as you push above consumer debt, my fund has returns more in the 15% range. As you push above 10%, you really start to get into returns where even with some kind of a small value tilt, emerging markets, whatever it is, it's tough to convince yourself that you're going to get returns at that level. Um, especially in IRA accounts. I think it works beautifully in uh, tax-protected vehicles. Uh, and also, of course, with the, rising, you know, with the possibility of a rising rate environment and the fear of inflation, I think it works well to, protect, to, um, to fit against fixed income. The interesting thing about private debt is it's not really, it doesn't exist in the asset management marketplace. Like I took a survey um, um, on, uh, on fund administrators. Opus is my fund administrator. And I took a survey uh, for them and uh, I was meant to choose what kind of hedge fund I was, and there wasn't private debt. It wasn't even an option. So it's sort of the double duty for wealth managers to both explain what private debt is and then convince people that they should have it. Um, the, next, the next question, I think, is sort of how do you do due diligence on this, this new thing? And I think that's where the transparency helps. Um, for the most part, these funds are almost completely transparent in mine. You can actually see what's in the fund. You can do the same thing or understand what's in the fund you know, when you look at lending club funds. And then the same, then the finally, the question I think is, how do you convince investors that they should own this? And that um, has a lot to do with downside risk. So sort of working all the way back to your original question, uh, m most of the fear is not around what happens right now. Everyone likes the idea that they're going to get 10% returns in consumer debt or 15% business loans or whatever it is. It's, well, what will happen when there's a recession? The way I typically tell that story, in addition to talking about how Lending Club's data is available and you can look at the data and so on, is I pull up the Federal Reserve's G19 report and I show how persistent, I show there's $850 billion of consumer debt, and I show at what rate it's revolved for a fairly long period of time, 13%. And then I pull up another report on the Federal Reserve website, which has the default rates. It's the non-seasonally adjusted charge-offs for all banks. And what you can see there quite clearly is that charge-offs peaked, sort of post-recession charge-off peaked in Q2 2010 for banks at something like 10.97%. So this is a kind of a worst-case scenario in which the 
raw, the gross rate minus the charge-offs rate was still positive, and that tends to settle a lot of people's nerves. Well, and let's carry this down a little further. So one of the things we've seen, certainly in the money management industry, is that this intermediation process, ETFs are a good example of how people are deciding they're going to get an index and replace money managers. So specifically to a return asset that's 9%, 10%, 11%, how does the wealth manager fit into that? What is the value add that they bring that justifies their fee schedule associated with it? And is that a better way for an investor to proceed, or is it better to go directly even if it's a captive LC advisors, just directly to a platform? And how, how would each of you see that? Well, speaking for ourselves, I, I, I think if you're going to participate in the asset class at scale, you really need a, an infrastructure to do so. And frankly, we don't have it. I think you would need someone like Brendan's group to do that. Um, I mean, if, if you're on the platform and you're buying in accordance with your own uh, uh, acquisition criteria, you know, you have to know what you're doing and you have to... Uh, have support, and most people are not going to be able to do that. And even ourselves, we're a fairly large uh, market participant. You know, we're in the Lending Club Advisors Funds, and I think for most retail investors, it makes sense for them to be uh, in the hands of someone like Brendan, as opposed to trying to figure out how to do it themselves. Yeah. Well, so the answer for me on the fund side is that because my loans are not fractionalized, it generally makes sense for even fairly large investors to end up in the fund. Um, with respect to wealth management and what I do with clients when I'm trying to get them exposure to consumer debt, I generally always recommend funds. And the reason is not because I'm not sophisticated enough to use nickel steamroller or one of the other pieces of software to automate the purchase of loans and actually have low cash drag, buy good loans, and so on. It's really because... Um, uh, the funds the, the funds do a lot of things. One of the things that people sometimes forget the funds do is because they can adopt mark to market, the funds are able to net short term capital losses and interest income and that 's actually something of real value so trying to have a separately managed account as an individual investor can be difficult unless you want to end up with short term capital losses at the end of the year that you need to do something with so for me. You know, because I don't generally have a lot of client assets in equities, I don't really need short-term capital losses, and the funds make a lot of sense for that reason and then for also for the other reasons. I, I think one thing that has to, to, to develop in the market, and I think it's important to appreciate that the market is truly in its infancy. We're, you know, we're th three, four, five years into it. Um, what has to happen is you have to have the ability to trade the assets. We have to have the ability to go short this asset class and market participants have to be able to express views as to whether to buy, hold, or, or go, go short these asset classes. Then we'll have to look at what the market yields look like relative to the underwriting yields. And I, I look forward to the day when the market uh, uh, platform operators have to uh, look at the variance between what, how they're pricing debt on the platform and how the market's pricing it. It'll converge. And I think those are good points. I mean, we certainly highlight, you know, you hear a lot about the principal versus agency that Howard was talking about. And certainly what you're talking about is a very hot topic for a lot of people, mm -hmm. which relates to how do you price these assets? Uh, what happens is the portfolios are tend to be new, particularly as you're adding capital, they're not seasoned. Understanding the underlying true return of the portfolio right. is hard to estimate. Any sense of actual market-based pricing right. is completely missing at this point. Uh, and in terms of that, and what I say is completely, I should say it's not easily available to people. I mean, how do you guys see the pricing aspect? And it, for the other uh, issue would be the custody-related issues associated with where the platforms originate and the assets actually set. Because operational concerns are obviously a major forefront for a lot of people who invest money in any asset class. Uh, so specifically to pricing, custody, how do you guys see the, those, those issues uh, in terms of your fund or your experience? You know, if this is just debt, then it only has two characteristics that are associated with its pricing, which is the duration and duration risk and the credit risk. And I think a lot of the questions I get are, well, why is there so much yield here? And I think part of the reason why there's a lot of yield right now, and I don't know whether this will go away or not, but part of the reason why there's a lot of yield right now is because it's all just small potatoes, and we don't have huge buckets of money flooding in because what would they flood into? Are they going to, is a large institutional investor with a 5 or 10% cap on its ability to own a single fund 
going to participate in a $100 million fund? Maybe, but a lot of much bigger investors than that you know, can't even enter. So I think it will be interesting to see as larger buckets of money are actually able to enter this industry, whether it then moves the needle. And I think the countervailing force to that is, well, there's $850 billion worth of credit card debt, and this looks a lot like balance transfers into amortizing loans, and therefore the outsized returns could last a really long time. Okay, uh, to you, Brendan and Howard, specifically in terms of customers that you're talking to, what, what are their biggest objections and what are the ones do you think are real in terms of what, what they're thinking about in allocating capital to the space? You mean, um, uh, the, the, generally it's the, uh, the, for me, because I'm working with platforms that for the most part were not making significant amounts of loans in 2007, the big question is, well, how is this going to perform during a recession? And I kind of touched on my answer earlier. That's almost, that really, in a nutshell, is the question that you're asked, or that I'm asked, over and over again. And, of course, you can reflect on the, the G19 and what I said there. Um, it's also the case that with a product that has yields as high as it currently does, right, like uh, yields debt to investors of 15%, you could have a lot of businesses default and still protect principal. So 15%, that's one in every seven businesses on Main Street that's with an average history of 10 and a half years defaulting. That's an awfully big recession. And I think that helps people anecdotally understand how this whole thing doesn't just you know, doesn't just blow up if there's a big recession. You know, from a wealth management perspective, a lot of what I'm looking for is underwriter diversification. So when I think about how much of someone's money I can put into this asset class, I'm really thinking of that and then also how much can I put at Lending Club? How much can I put at Prosper? Every time there's a new underwriter and there were stages full of them, it gets me excited about the fact that I have somebody else's equation that I can learn, come to trust, and then mm -hmm. um, you know, develop a fund around. So, of course, my fund aggregates small business lenders that mainly do daily repayments, but others will exist that will aggregate different types of underwriters. And I think that's what's exciting because what happens is you get client pressure because of the results to put more and more and more in Lending Club and Prosper. And there need to be other outlets for that. And I think that is what's evolving pretty quickly. And there's a lot of good still small and growing uh, private debt managers that will help um, you know, get those assets into these underwriters. Okay, well, why don't we open up for questions? And we've got a number of questions. All right, why don't we start in the far corner over there? Um, how do you guys uh, charge fees? How do you justify for the client? And especially given what uh, Howard said, that it's sort of a cash pump alternative, can you then turn around and charge fees to the client? So the question relates to how do they charge fees and how do they justify their fee level? Uh, I run a 1 in 10 fund in the direct lending fund, and I generally feel um, like that, that that has felt like it's worked out. I'm not, I didn't come up with that. Um, uh, Colchis is a, f a fund that I've used. I've, pro I've used most of the funds in this space. I've used Howard's fund, um, and... Um, the, but that fee structure has seemed to have been one that people, that people are willing to resonate with. It's sort of half of private equity. Um, and one of the ways that I explain it is not that it's so much less than private equity, but that typically the underwriter takes a fee. So it's almost like you have two partners in the ability of creating something investable. Um, and um, people seem to be satisfied with it. Honestly, how many other ways are there to get 10% or 15% returns? It seems as if one in ten. Now Howard's uh, fees are different, and he can speak to that. But it seems as if ultimately the way. So the way the pie really gets divided, right, is uh, in my fund. It's approximately eighteen percent or seventeen and a half percent gross yield. That's net of defaults. One percent for expenses. One in ten is around two and a half percent, and then the rest is for investors. So investors are getting fifteen. The fund manager is getting two and a half. I don't know, it, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, I've thought about increasing my fee structure when I go to Europe or whatever it might be, but I think for whatever reason people have felt, and maybe it's just the kind of innate fairness in an industry that's sort of frontier and feels like we're trying to be good guys all around, but it's felt like the fee structure can be softer and we can be okay with that. Okay, I saw another, some hands right here. Mm -hmm. Question for Brendan about why the focus on business lending. Oh, um, the question was why the focus on business lending. 
um, because uh, I, I believe that it is. So, so Noah was here talking about how uh, how what he's doing is uh, creating new, completely new credit for people who were not able to get their credit, uh, as opposed to on the consumer side where it's it, it exists. I think part of the reason why the yields on the consumer side are a little lower is because it looks like I said like kind of balance transfers into amortizing loans. On the businesses, they're just willing to pay, creditworthy businesses are just willing to pay astonishing amounts of money. Um, and to me, it felt like that was where the absolute most money could be made um, with the shortest duration. So, uh, you know, tw 12 months or less, uh, and just incredibly high rates and low defaults. Um, Other questions, right here? Yeah. Uh, question, Brendan. Um, other than security selection and diversification, how are you guys hedging credit risk? So we're not yet, but we think what will come with size uh, is the ability to both provide a traditional structured product to be able to provide some kind of principal enhancement to those investors that want to take less capital risk. Uh, we also think that long term there'll be insurance protection uh, that you'll be able to buy to, to again, ensure capital preservation for those institutions that are willing to trade current income for you know, capital preservation. I think both of those will come as the asset class grows. I mean, this may come off as unsophisticated, uh, but I don't have really any intention to, to address that. I think the yields are strong, and um, to the extent that the risks aren't well understood, as I said anecdotally, the world would have to be a very different place for principal to be invaded, uh, you know, in a fund like mine or in any fund that does private debt right now. Question right over here. Yes, I'd actually ask a question of two people. I'd actually ask a question of two people out in the hallway and in one of the workshops. But when do you guys foresee perhaps a forty-act or mutual fund structure entering the market? And if so, how would it be structured? Yeah. 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 It, it's an, I mean, it is an interesting question. Uh, you know, one possibility is with the uh, interval fund, which for those that aren't familiar is a kind of a closed-end fund that caps redemptions um, and makes them available on a quarterly basis to people who schedule in advance. So that would, that would fit well, um, and I do know someone that's thinking about that for this space. Um, I think it's difficult in the absence of the liquidity, um, uh, you know, that you were talking about to envision a, just a completely straightforward fund that could have a run on it. Um, it's it's a, that's a bit challenging right now. It is challenging. In addition to that, there's some security rules that define them as similar securities. You have consultation risks that they won't allow you to even create the fund with. In addition, pricing is a critical element to it, and of course, liquidity is also. So I'm sure they're going to figure a way to solve for that, but it's not going to be immediate. You know, I don't even know if it's necessary from the standpoint of the amount of capital, the amount of loans that are available to buy are just so small that that amount of loans can be purchased easily by institutions and, and, and uh, family offices. So we're not running out of supply yet to the point where it needs to be, those, where all those things need to be solved. Yeah, that, that was an issue when, when we looked at uh, the LCA funds. And from my standpoint, you know, you know, the LCA funds are basically selling the beta. It's a small, transparent management fee. And, um, as between the funds and the self-managed account investors and the third-party funds and levered funds, as Scott said this morning, there's a fair apportionment among those different constituencies. And I think they're very sensitive to the reputational risks uh, around uh, being seen to favor um, their own funds. So that was a concern that I had, but I don't think it's a material one at this point. I won't comment out on that. You know, in this room, there may not be a lot of people who have an appetite for the conservative credit fund, which is sort of the broad-based fund's little brother. Uh, but the conservative credit fund is an index fund that generates returns of 55 or 65 percent. I have one client in it. Um, and that's probably not a fund that could sustain a lot of high management fees, but it's a great fund, and a lot of people who are skeptical of the asset class and want a toe dip could find themselves in the, in the conservative credit fund. Okay, I want to thank everybody. I think we're, we're get, look like we're going to get the hook here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.